As you can see, I'm starting a passage or a, actually it's going to be a series over time talking about the Islamic nature of the Antichrist. Um, and there's a lot to be said for that in the Bible. And so we'll try and hit some passages. And I put in defense of because there are a lot of people who argue that it's not Islamic. And so I'm going to try and hit some of the more difficult passages that they will use uh, in that regard. So um, I think it'll be pretty exciting. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you in bowed heads, lifted up hearts to you. We ask that you would open our eyes and our ears to your word. We want to see you in all of this and the big plan, the big picture that you've given to us through your word. Lord, we pray that this morning will be a, a glory to you, a, an honor, uh, not only in this section, but the one to come. Uh, we do it in light of holding up your book, your word that you gave to us. And so, Lord, let us recognize that. And just let our lives continue to be a demonstration of our love for you as we give you the praise and glory through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to begin in a few moments at looking at the chapter 12 of Revelation. The question always comes up as we start one of these is why do you study prophecy? And people have always said, you know, just preach the gospel. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Just, just preach the gospel. We don't need all this end times. Why are you bothering looking at all this stuff, right? And, and you know who your friends are who say that. And the Bible has a lot of answers to that. And in Revelation chapter 1, we have one such verse. John is told, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. He was given a command to write. If he was told to write, then there must be a good reason. Because written information is something we'll need to transmit and to learn from, right? So we're told in Revelation, we know, is you know, perhaps one of the most prophetic books of the Bible. And also in Matthew 24, verse 3, when the disciples were sitting down with Christ. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will all these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? If it wasn't important to study prophecy and know these things, and if you know Matthew 24, and if you've been with the ministry long enough, you know that's a very important book, isn't it? Packed with details. If it wasn't important for us to know that, this would be an opportunity to, for Christ to tell his apostles, disciples, and say, you don't need to know that, just preach the word, right? But he did. He gave very good detail on what's about to happen uh, with the end times. And lastly, uh, 2 Peter 3.17 you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, and he has just concluded teaching on last days, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. So there's a good reason to study all of this so that when these things happen, we will be secure. Because why? Because Christ told us that all of these things will happen. And we're just seeing the fulfillment of Scripture. And if he said they're going to happen, guess what? They will happen. For those who are unprepared, they will be shaken like the Thessalonians were, right? So we are not to be shaken or fall away or any of that. When we study about the Antichrist and end times, and especially the Islamic nature, because the Bible doesn't come right out and say the Antichrist will be Islamic, does it? Nowhere. That would be easy. No more discussion. We're done. So part of studying this particular topic means that we'll be weighing evidence. You know what that means? It means we're looking at scriptures in, in light of who the Antichrist might be. And then we come up with a conclusion that says, I think this best fits with an Islamic Antichrist. Okay? So that's the way we will be approaching all of these. Another thing we need to keep in mind is the Bible is a Middle East-centered book. 
with Israel in the bullseye, Israel in the middle. We need to keep that in context, and it's very difficult for us here in America, right? Because we think that we're the center of the universe, and everything revolves around America. I love our country, but guess what? It does not. God's book revolves around his people who are in the nation of Israel, and so keep that in light of whatever we study in Revelation, that that needs to be held in context. Anybody here get on the internet ever? <laughs> oh, you're not admitting it. Only a handful of hands went up. You know what cyber warfare is? Yeah, that's um, quite a, an activity, cyber warfare. It's on the top five of everybody's list of one of the most uh, concerns globally. Globally. Do you know that there are more devices than there are people on the planet? There are 7.6 billion people, but currently, as of 2017, there are 7.4 billion or 8.4 billion devices. That's enough for one for every person plus some. Do you know that these devices will triple in the next three years? That means there will be 20, around 20 billion of these devices around our world. Cyber people are doing this. They can't wait because they can do their attacking and grabbing. It's a big problem in the world that we live in. I was doing some reading on it, and do you know that businesses, on average, get attacked 130 times a year from an outside source, trying to either break in or get in and plant something? If you're on the internet, you have been, you have been attacked, whether you know it or not, and you may not. It's very dangerous, and it's something you really can't see. Anybody know what a cyber wildfire is? A cyber wildfire? No. A, wire, a wildfire on the cyber space is where somebody plants false information, and other people grab it, and it goes through the internet. I'm from Maine but I'm not gonna take this as a proud moment because I was reading of a guy in North Waterboro, Maine, and his job is to produce fake information on his website. He's one of hundreds and hundreds of people that do that to also just disseminate it throughout the internet world. What I'm saying is all of this warfare that's going on is very dangerous and the Ameri most Americans don't realize how dangerous it really is. But I just tell you that because there's something more dangerous than that, and it's called spiritual warfare. And it's been a long, around a lot longer than cyberspace. And just like cybersecurity and cyber warfare, many people ignore spiritual warfare. It's going on throughout our planet today, and it has for quite some time. So if you're in Revelation chapter 12, this is a great chapter that kind of gets into um, the spiritual aspect of spiritual warfare, as it talks about a woman who is Israel, nation Israel, a child, which is Christ, and then a dragon, which is Satan. These are the main players over the course of man's history. Let's look at verse 1 and begin there. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. So we understand that to be the nation Israel. Some people say it's Mary. Uh, I would disagree to that because of there's other information that leads us to the nation Israel. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And, and here we see 
a scene, a great sign, the first sign that Jesus Christ is being born. That's how this starts off. But then this passage goes back in time a little bit and talks about Satan. And here's what I'm trying to set up for you. We live in a world that's had spiritual warfare ever since the day of mankind came on this planet. Satan, God. It's still going on today. It's still being you. People are being used uh, by Satan, the dragon, to do his bidding here on planet Earth. Verse 3, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, Satan, having seven heads and ten horns. This is symbolic of all of those nations that Satan has used throughout the years and will use to do his bidding. Seven diadems on his head. Seven diadems, crowns. Verse 4, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. The word stars there is is quite frequently used of angels. So what you're seeing and we're being told here is in the beginning, Satan, when he rose up against God, you can look at Isaiah 14. I think that's a picture of, of the boldness and arrogance of, of Satan and his fall. I think this is where he gathers his demons. And they come, guess where? To earth. Think of that. A third of the stars in heaven. Is that a few or is that many? That's enormous. It's a spiritual world we live in. And... They're not sitting idly by. They are actively tempting and orchestrating according to their father, who happens to be Satan. And it's happening today. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, threw them to the earth. And this dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So here we have the red dragon Throwing the angels down to her demons, and I would say it's more of a leading than a throwing down. Always fascinated the way I think Christ was referring to this, this situation when he said in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I think he's talking about this time. When Satan at about the time of creation was thrown out, or drew out, or rebelled, and came to planet Earth. Christ says, I saw that. I saw him happen, and he came right there in the beginning. How do we know that? Because he's there in the garden with creation. He's there with Adam and Eve in the form of a serpent. And I think his demons were no less all over the place even at that time. We're about to start the war. We look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any of the beasts of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said? Fighting words. Starting the war. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden, questioning God's word. Same thing that happens today. Satan will do anything to discredit God. And here in the garden, he's going after God's own image. A prime target. You still are his prime target. Well, it didn't take long for Adam and Eve to hear all of that. And guess what? They sinned. They took of the fruit. And now God is part of his judgment in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity, warfare, enemies between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. I underline that because I'm highlighting the fact that this is a war that started all the way back there. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. So this war has been going on ever since the garden, starting right there, and continues again to this day. It continued on through Satan. After Genesis, we see Cain. I think God, Satan used Cain in a way to come against God. Satan was going to do anything to wipe out the seed, wouldn't he? 
and he tried many different ways to go after the, the seed. Remember the flood? The sons of God infiltrated this world, another attack upon God and his people. And then we have uh, Nimrod and Tower of Babel continues on. These are all tools of Satan, tools of Satan. You know, but then God comes up with Abraham and he pulls him out of Ur. And he says, now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. And we understand and know that to be Israel even uh, today. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Well, it didn't take long after that for Satan to mount up his attack. And he influenced uh, Abraham to take matters into his own hand, as you know, and they had Ishmael. And Ishmael um, was a warlike man, but he was at odds with Isaac and has been ever since, hasn't he? So the war continues. Ishmael, Esau, Joseph's brothers. Then we see nations. Egypt enslaves the nation of Israel or the people of God. And then we see Assyria takes care of the northern tribes of Israel in about 722 BC. Babylonians rise up next in around 600, 586 in several waves. They come against the nation Judah, the southern tribes, and they bring them into exile. The Medes and the Persians, they come in and they attack. The Greeks through Alexander the Great and then his four generals, then the Romans. I mean, this war has been... Satan has been using these nations to come against God and his people and his plan of salvation ever since that time. Look back in your, your book here in verse 4. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. There's a, another attack being made by um, Satan, he's going to devour the child, and we know who he used. The Bible tells us when we look at that, then Herod. Remember the story? You'll hear about it maybe this time of year. Herod saw that the child was going to be born, so he comes up with a plan to kill all the two-year-olds. That's Satan-inspired. That's part of the spiritual warfare that had been going on since the uh, beginning of time as far as, as we um, know it. So here he is, ready to give birth to David, a child as it was born. Verse 5, she bore a male child, whom we know as Christ, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. His time to rule is not yet. That's, I believe, is talking about the ascension of Christ up into heaven to his throne, where Stephen, the first martyr, saw him there. And he's waiting for his return, which we call the second coming. Then the woman fled into the wilderness. Verse 6. The woman is Israel, and she flees into the wilderness after this. And this we know as being um, the nation Israel now is on the, the run. And this here is most likely talking about the nation Israel fleeing from the Antichrist. So between verse 5, which is talking about Christ's ascension into heaven, and verse 6 is quite a period of time until he flees from the Antichrist. Do you remember in Matthew 24, verse 16, where Christ told them, he said, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. When is that taking place? It's taking place once the Antichrist rises up in the temple and declares war on the Jewish people and on Christians, those who hold the name of Christ in his testimony. I believe we're reading that here in verse 6, because if you look at how verse 6 ends in Revelation, where she has a place prepared by God, which many believe to be the mountains, and maybe um, 
those up in uh, Jordan today. But she prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. A very familiar time, isn't it, for all of us? Because we know that how long that is. Three and a half years. So that tells us this must be occurring. This fleeing into the wilderness must be occurring in the last half of Daniel's 70th week. So it's kind of given us a recap of the spiritual war that's going on. Now this, of course, hasn't happened yet, has it? We're still anticipating, looking forward for that, but we know it's going to play out. And then in verse 7, And war broke out in heaven. That just seems odd, doesn't it? There would be war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. So we have a war between Michael and Satan and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out and the serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. We all know that Satan was fell to the earth at creation and tempted Adam and Eve and has been creating war ever since. But in God's wisdom, he has allowed Satan access to heaven even today. The Bible says he's up there accusing, accusing us before God. We know that we see Job. He comes before God on account of Job. We see Joshua, the high Priest, he comes to God on account of him. So for some reason, God allows Satan to come back and forth and into heaven. But there will be a time when God said, okay, cast out forever, down to earth forever. Things will change. And that will be towards the end of the 70 weeks or in that last week of time as we know it. Verse 10 of Revelation, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Again, describing this spiritual warfare. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. A great war on earth is about to break out at this point in time, like there's never been before. And Satan will be let loose, and the Bible says he will be unrestrained by whatever is not restraining him. And then he will make and wage war against the nation Israel and against Christians. Now I want to go to verse 13. Now when the dragon saw they'd been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, Again, the woman is, is Israel, the nation Israel, and he goes and he goes persecuting him. I'm going to pause there in chapter 12. I'll let you read the rest. But I want you to remind you of the description of the dragon there in verse 3. Go back to it. Fiery dread dragon having seven heads and ten horns. Do you see it? Those are symbolic of the seven empires or seven nation empires that... Satan has used over time, and the ten horns uh, would be kings over those nations, or primarily over the last um, empire. Look at verse thir chapter 13, verse 1. I want you to see this. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Most people agree, as I do, that this is a picture or a description of the Antichrist rising up. The reason he has seven heads and ten horns, just like Satan, is because like father, like son. He is going to represent Satan here on earth in bodily form. He will t 
take his role. And most people, or a lot of people, think he may be alive today, this Antichrist. But there will be a point in time when he is alive and he will battle against mankind, especially Jewish people and Christians. These seven heads, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medea, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And I put down the final beast. That's the one we're looking for. That's the one we'll spend our time looking at. That's the one that everybody is trying to figure out who is this final beast. Most people look at this description and say, I agree with the first six, no problem, but I don't know who this final beast is. And, and I'll just say right off that I believe it to be an Islamic empire with an Islamic or a Muslim leader who will lead all of this. This battle is a spiritual battle that has come from the Middle East. And in my opinion, Islam is the best representative when I weigh the facts of that empire that will best represent Satan and his power and his attack against Israel. And I think a lot of that comes from even, look at the history, Ishmael. They claim Ishmael to be their lineage, their genealogy, and through him they claim comes Muhammad. What better religion that would parallel Christianity and claim the same father, Abraham, up until the end? That would be just like Satan to do that. Well, this war is going to wind its way through the entire Bible, starting in Genesis and all the way to Revelation, when we see the conclusion in the battle. But every author in the Bible sometimes will use a different name for the Antichrist. A lot of people like to say, well, this is different people. I would like to tell you, I think it's the author giving his view of that Antichrist. Let me give you an example. Daniel and Revelation call him the beast or the little horn. Their description. Daniel also calls him the prince, the king of the north, the abomination of desolation, which Christ repeats in Matthew 24. Ezekiel calls him Gog. Isaiah and Micah call him the Assyrian. 2 Thessalonians says the man of lawlessness, the man of sin, the son of perdition. So you can see that there are very many names, not because there are very many antichrists, although there are, but they're all talking about them in their own words, in their own context. And as I move through these, and again, it's going to take several sessions, we'll look at all of these titles and how they best fit an Islamic antichrist. That's what we're doing. Who's going to be the best tool of Satan? If we keep the big picture, the big picture, we know it's got to fit into that picture of Satan's spiritual warfare. Who is the best tool that will come out and bring deception and lies and will come against Christ and be that anti-Christ that the Bible talks about and lead into false worship? If you're looking back in the history of Christianity, Maybe many of you know that about 380 A.D. Constantine, he sort of legalized Christianity. And it's around that time that the Roman Catholic Church came into existence, although they will argue that. But I think that's about the time. The Roman Catholic Church took a stranglehold, I, would, I call it, on Christianity. And they brought about a lot of control over our faith, including the authority over the Bible, including um, indulgences and worship of saints, worship of Mary, and ideologies such as purgatory, even their whole salvation work, it's faith plus works in order to get into heaven. So a lot of people over the years have said, well, they seem like a very good candidate, right? And people today say it's the same thing. It's a false system of worship, and, and it is. But are they the best candidate for the Antichrist? So the question I'll raise to you, is the Antichrist the Pope or a Pope? And this one has been around for a long time, probably from the Middle Ages, maybe even earlier than that. 
and it's still a viewpoint today. But as we weigh the evidence, does the Pope best fit our picture of what the Antichrist um, will be? This was popular around the time of the West, around the Reformation. Document used by Presbyterians and those Reformers, the Westminster Confession, says there is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Nor can the Pope of Rome, in any sense, be head thereof, but is that Antichrist? Is that clear enough of what they thought? They obviously thought that the Pope in 1646 was that Antichrist. Well, fortunately today they have eliminated that part of it and it just stops right there. That was done in 1788. They said, nah, I don't think it can be the Pope. So even they have decided um, it's not going to be him. Now the Catholic Church does have a lot of doctrine that's wrong and actually deceiving. Uh, Christ plus works equals salvation. That's their formula. Um, they, they will argue with you that they believe in faith alone. And if you go into their website, and, and again, this is not on the Catholic Church, this talk, but go into their website, it says faith alone. However, their practice of their sacraments, it's a required work in order to be saved. So they can say it's faith alone, but their doctrine by practice, meaning what they do, demands works in order to be saved. And if you don't do the works, you can lose your salvation, which makes it a false gospel. The Pope is very powerful, but I don't believe he'll work into the system of Satan to be used as the Antichrist, capital A. Do they have any scriptural resources? Well, as a matter of fact, they do. Little children, this is 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, 19. Little children, it's the last hour, end times. And as many of you heard that the Antichrist, and you can see in, in this version anyways, capitalized, is coming. Even now, many antichrists, small a, have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. So those who claim that it's the Pope say that it has to be, the antichrist has to be one of us, based on this verse, in order to fit. But is that a proper deduction? Do, does the Antichrist necessarily have to come out from Christianity? No, it does not. It's not a logical conclusion based on, on this verse. But I might argue that since we all have the same father, Christians have Abraham, our lineage goes back, genealogy goes back, Jewish people have Abraham, and so does the Islam goes all the way back to Abraham. So perhaps we do all come out from the same person of Abraham. But I do not believe that the Antichrist necessarily has to come out from a Christian faith. But then I go a couple verses later and I see 1 John 2.22. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Now, I have a hard time believing that the Pope or the Catholic Church would deny the Father or the Son. They may misrepresent him, but to deny him, I haven't seen that in the Catholic Church. Yes, they got a false system of worship, but I do not believe they would actually deny the Father in the Son in this sense. Then if we look at even the description, the definition of Antichrist, look at the word anti there in the black, over, against, opposite, instead of, in place of. Would the Pope put himself in place of Christ? I don't see that happening either. It's just not, he's not fitting. And that's what I'm trying to say. He's not working out to be our best candidate. And then um, look over in 
Revelation chapter 13, verse 4 to 6. In verse 4, So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who's like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Keep in mind the Pope. Would he be somebody that is warlike and ready to do battle with at that level? In verse 5, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him, Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Again, I have a hard time placing the Pope in that position. He doesn't fit. Although he, he represents false doctrine, I don't see him fitting in that case. And then one last verse here in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. And we may go here in a later session, but this is talking about the Antichrist. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, this is interesting, I underlined it, and shall intend to change times and law. Times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half time. So obviously it's at the end of that seventh, 70th week. Would the Pope change times and law? If so, what would he change? We already have a Judeo-Christian calendar. What would he change on times? And as I thought about that and pondered that just a little bit, you have to think about Islam. Change times and law. And again, here we're weighing the evidence. Is the Pope best fit or is an Islamic Antichrist? There is an Islamic, anti, an Islamic calendar that you can buy that's completely different than the one that we use. They started it around 622 AD with Muhammad. It has a 355 day year. Today is the 21st of Rabbi El Awal 1440. You can use that on your trivia games if you want to. <laughs> and then also they would love to institute Sharia law. So I'm gonna ask you now, does the Pope best fit this, or does someone with an Islamic nature best fit this? And I, we have to conclude, it has to be an Islamic nature best fitting. So we're gonna write the Pope off. Notice I didn't even talk about Donald Trump being the Antichrist. You laugh. About two months ago, we got an email. People write the funniest things, so be careful what you write because I get most of them on my desk because I'm right next to customer service. Got it. They brought this in and they said, he wants to know what we have in our, in our resources that will, he can use to prove that Donald Trump's the Antichrist. <laughs> it's out there, but sadly, we don't have anything like that. But um, again, we don't have a name, but I think we have a direction to head and that's towards Islam. Now, I've given you a lot to think about and something to start into. We're going to, we will dig more deeply into some passages and further sessions as I open it up, but I wanted you to understand the significance of the spiritual war that we're in. To understand that this Antichrist theme is just not something pulled out for end times. It's the culmination. It's the final battle of a centuries and thousands of years of battles where it's been Satan using his pawns and his people and his influences to move in a direction to stop the seed. Couldn't stop it. Now he's moving in a direction to persecute the saints and God's apple of his eye, the nation Israel. But there will be a meeting of God and Satan in the end, but the nations will begin to move. And here at Zion's Hope, we watch the nations because we're looking for God's plan to be working out and understanding fully that he's working in a spiritual nature. That's our biggest concern and we wanna do it so that we can enlighten people so that they can be strong in the Lord and be able to understand from our perspective 
what this war looks like. I'm going to close here with a, with a prayer and just absorb this into our heart. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Revelation 12. Just a quick general summary of this spiritual war. Each one of us in this room has a role to play. We are warriors for Christ. You have called us into battle, but we do not battle one of flesh and blood. We do of principalities and spirits. And so, Lord, let us go forth in that way. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We look forward to his coming and the glorious procession to follow. We thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at one 888 781-9466. Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.